Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to start with what propelled you to create all these works with textiles because as a fiber artist, I'm always interested in learning why an artist would choose cloth over paint, metal, clay, uh, glass, stone. <laughs> Not everybody would make that choice. So what propelled you to, to work in this way? That's a great question. I'm going to start by saying I do make work in all kinds of materials, in clay and in paint and in metal and in wood. Um, and I think that there are two reasons. One is more personal and one is more um, conceptual. So I grew up in a family of sewers. So my, my grandmother, my mother and my aunt all so, and um, and so these materials had a special meaning for me. I also had a lot of dysfunction in my family, and so sewing was one of the ways um, that we could be together. Um, you know, there was animosity, mostly stemming from my mother's um, heroin addiction. So there was tensions in the family, but we all could be together. Uh, regardless of our um, of different um, beliefs or animosities, you know, you could we could be together and so and e admire each other's mm -hmm. stitching work, and it was this sort of interesting space where it could be quiet and and actually I think the act of sewing would sort of uh, calm things down, um, and so. It has a, those materials had a really deep resonance for me, and um, and also my grandmother. I mean, I learned how to sew from all of those women in my family, but my grandmother, um, I was particularly close to. She was probably the the matriarch of sewing. She was the best in every aspect. Um, she was a terrible teacher. She was very impatient. And she, so I got a lot of edge work, you know, she would just sort of have me do the basting and the hems and the kind of, um, not the fun stuff really, but just the edge work. So um, I think that the edges, that is kind of the earliest iteration mm -hmm. of being with the edges of seams and hems and things like that. And then when I was at UC Berkeley, I think, I think my practice is really rooted in drawing and painting and in the figure and in landscape. And when I was at UC Berkeley, they had all of these facilities. So you could study metal. There was a metal shop and a workshop and a ceramics shop. And I think I became a materials freak and I experimented mm -hmm. in all of those um, materials. But then I kind of returned to textiles as something that felt like it belonged to me in a really personal way. Mm -hmm. And I was also studying art history. I was registering the absence of a, the, a woman's perspective. And mm -hmm. so I would, I would imagine the women being in these historical moments uh, in their sewing you know, and talking about the events of mm -hmm. the day. And so I, I just became intrigued with the materials as I don't know, referring to that in a way, referring to that history, referring to those perspectives that were missing from um, the canon of art history. So it was, it was twofold. Well, that, that's really interesting because working with cloth, number one, whether you were weaving or sewing or embroidering or crocheting or knitting, was for so long only considered women's domestic craft mm -hmm. and was trivialized in that way. And today fiber art has a very different cachet and you're helping that with your, with your work. But I want to go back to something you said. I wasn't going to talk about this till later, but 
describing the women sitting together makes me think of the title of the exhibit, The Threads That Bind. So while there were other things, the animosities that you refer to, it sounds like the threads helped bind the women together in a, in a more positive way than the negative things that were happening. It did, yeah, um, in my family for sure. Um, it was something that we all did and we admired um, each other. And I have little bits of each one of those family mm. members in, my, in the way that I sew and also in, I think, in my art practice. Um, yeah, my mother was probably the wildest of, of all of them, and she would make stuff out of all kinds of stuff mm. um, in the 70s. And uh, s so my aunt was really, my Aunt Reve was really precise, could follow patterns, and my, um, my grandmother was just amazing. She could work in any material. She wasn't intimidated by anything. She could make her own patterns. She was fearless. That's great. Yeah. Um, so, looking around at all the materials here, I have to ask myself, do you begin a project with an idea and then find the materials that will help you realize your intention, or do you start with materials that speak to you and lead you to create these various works? And so what was the progression? How is the process of creating these works part of your overall concept? And realize it's a lot of questions, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I can okay. unpack it a bit. I think um, it's a great question, too, because I think that many of the pieces, there's not one answer, I'll say that. So many of the pieces, um, I'm always collecting and sort of looking for materials so that's an ongoing process of going to antique fairs and being drawn to materials and um, scavenging them that way. Um, and so I, I think when I first started working with these materials and developing this language, I was more process oriented. Um, I. So, and I like that in my practice. I, I don't like to have full control. I like being out of control a little bit. So I might have sort of the skeleton idea or something that's compelling me, or sometimes it's like, sometimes it's a question like, what does that look like? Um, how would that, how could you, like with continents, for example, you know, I was really thinking about this idea of geological deep time that, um, these long, long histories that are in the sediments of the earth. And I started thinking about how, what would culture, if you looked at culture in this really deep, geological deep time and all the shifts and changes, like what would that look like? And I started thinking about just even identity. Um, you know, I think if, if any of us were to sort of mine the deep history of our ancestry that there would be this really complex um, mixing and tanglements and histories that are in opposition and I was really interested in like how how can what could that look like um, so and then other times I I get um, a specific idea I think that in this room the most was the threads that bind that was something that came to me with its title. I knew what I was gonna do, and it was, and I was pretty far into this um, material and this language, so it came with clarity, and it was a matter of just making it. So if you go to these um, antique fairs, mm -hmm. what is it about these kinds of pieces, lace and so on, that you are collecting? Like, why do you go for those as opposed to, oh, I don't know, someone else looking for silk from Japan or beads or whatever other things they like to collect and work with? What is it about these pieces that draws you? 
I think um, I was interested in looking for things, materials that um, could be handmade, that could be historical. I was trying to kind of pin down something that would place us around the 18th, 19th mm -hmm. century. Um, I wanted things that had sort of the fingerprint of history on them that mm -hmm. were dirty mm -hmm. and stained and broken and um, initially, and I think when I, in the earlier works, I was working more with trim. Um, so I was thinking of, you know, crocheting and embroidering and just really trying to find things that were handmade. And then I started deconstructing clothing and I became sort of interested in that. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and then have moved, started from there, started moving into uh, what it would, what would it be like to work with whole fabrics like um, the busts and the dickies. And um, so that's kind of what I've been doing lately, pushing the work from painting into sculpture and um, working with whole pieces and fragments. So are, are you calling this painting with textiles, or are you calling it collage, or uh, is there a new category? Oh, I love, you're pinning me down. She's pinning me down. <laughs> um, I have an idiosyncratic tension that I like to be in of my own making where that has compelled me, where I want to be between fine art and craft. I want to be between painting and sculpture. I want to be, be between the past and the present. Um, and it just plays out in weird ways. Like I don't sew these on, I do paint them on. Um, and then uh, the only one that has stitches is uh, the threads that bind. And um, I've always wanted to I think as someone who sews, for, for whatever reason, I just wanted to make a contemporary statement with um, uh, materials that have a really strong orientation with um, the past and, and with, with women. I wanted to really push that and see if I could make a contemporary statement with those materials. I like the idea of creating work that makes us think about the ways in which the past are still present with us or still reverberating with us. So um, yeah, I think when I first was making this work, I think you know, I, was, I was an older student making art out of these really grandmotherly types of materials, but my muses were Agnes Martin and Eva Hesse and really trying to um, bring abstraction into it. I think you, were, you saw that when you did my studio visit. Yeah. You said yeah. something that I was using these, um, I forget exactly how you set up it, these historical materials to make very contemporary statements. Right. So as I look around at the fragments that you use, I can't help but wonder what they were before you joined them together. Mm. Um, who wore them, or did they cover furniture or hang in windows, you know, lace curtains and things like that. And you didn't even remove the tiny hooks and the tiny buttons, which I think is a, a really nice touch. Um, it's re if, you're, if you haven't looked closely, it's important to get in close and see the details of what's there, as well as the feeling that you get standing back, you know, the, the overall sense of the work. Um, so what were you thinking? What was your <laughs> thinking behind using such fragments? Yeah, I think I was, um, I mean, it's different for different, there's several bodies of work in here. Uh, so it depends on the body of work. But yeah, I was thinking, I mean, initially, I think I was thinking about the edges of things, about um, trims and, and cuffs of sleeves and under things, the things that we adorn ourselves for baptisms and weddings and 
funerals and graduations and um, the role of textiles in those um, events of our life. And then I started thinking about all the layers of meaning that textiles can hold. Like um, I started thinking about the cotton itself and um, slavery and the labor and movement of these materials and, and the many countries involved um, in profiting from the slave trade and the cultivation of cotton. And I, I thought that they were, I think cotton and material fabric textiles is, is something, it's, it can hold these histories that are entangled mm -hmm. and um, in contradiction, right? So that you can be looking at something that is, could be the ruffle of a cuff of a very wealthy person, but in that same material is the labor and the forced labor of slaves in that history. And so um, I, that was very compelling to me mm -hmm. in the work. I'm going to move on to uh, particular works mm -hmm. uh, because each one of them is evocative in a different way. And I, I have questions about them. We look at an artist's work and see what we see from our mm -hmm. perspective. And it may not necessarily be what the artist intended, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask about that. Yeah. Um, uh, you talk about your work being contemporary, and I, uh, that's very clear. And at the same time, I can sense that you're reaching back into history, definitely. So the threads that bind a, di a divided nation. First, how do you understand that division, and are the colors in the different regions of that piece are they um, are the different colors intentional, or I mean, because you you had to select the pieces and where you put them. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what what you were intending by doing it that way. I think that piece, what I was compelled by in making that work was this was in 2020, and I was compelled by um, the politics of our country and we and the polarization and we were seeing a lot of maps you know of you know what what states were red and what streets were blue and um, and I was struck by how it reminded me of earlier moments in American history mm -hmm. when the debates around slave states as and the westward expansion um, it was so similar um, in terms of the political rhetoric. I, I felt it was very haunted by that history. So that was one of the things that compelled me to make this work. I was also, as a historian, I'm aware of the many flags done by the many men in the canon of art history. And so I wanted to, I wanted to be a black queer woman that made a flag. I wanted to make my flag and my language um, and I wanted the Mason-Dixon line to be a part of it. There's some fabrication in that because some of those states didn't exist when the Mason-Dixon mm -hmm. line was happening. So I, I, I um, composed that from multiple projections of different maps from different time periods. And um, I think that I was, I was sort of shocked by where we've come as a country and feeling really vulnerable and fearful. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the states felt like, um, you know, dangerous to me, strangers to me. And um, I was shocked that they would have these beliefs and attitudes. And, um, and so I think this was a way for me to process that and to get to know them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so when I was um, composing them, the colors were not necessarily, um, you know, 
significant about a lot of those states because I haven't been to a lot of those states and I don't know a lot of those states. So some of it was my own imagining, like, oh, I think this is the farm country or the plains, you know. Um, so in that way, mm -hmm. it was informing what I would choose, um, but I would also be very intuitive about it and kind of let it occur to me. Um, I think, you know, there's some that were more intentional than others. Sometimes it was like, like there's one state, I don't even know which one it is, but there's some disintegration. Mm -hmm. And um, that the shape of that state, I wanted to use that material and mm -hmm. I wanted that disintegration and it was right for it. Um, some of them, like, I, ha I like New Orleans, and so um, I gave Louisiana a little shine with a little ruffle, you know, like, <laughs> brrr, um, in, the, in the work, you know, and the Virginias and Tennessees, you know, there's a, there's a piece of corset, uh, you know, corsets used to have actual metal boning right. in it, so there's a state that has a little bit of that blade is sticking out and then the hooks that mm -hmm. were, have been rusted and gnarly um, so you know it's just my own perception and fear I felt like I was just handling these mm -hmm. the map of these states that I actually don't really know they feel like strangers to me many of them and they feel a little scary um, I was surprised at the East Coast. I was surprised that there were so many weirdly shaped, teeny tiny little states all puzzled together. Didn't really know that, but being sort of engaged mm -hmm. with this map, um, I was getting to know them a little bit. So did you stain or in any way manipulate the color of those pieces, or were, did, did you find them like that? I found them mm -hmm. like that, or cut them up, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I didn't manipulate any of the color. I haven't really with any of my work. Okay. So one of the things that struck me is that lace is not a material that we think of as divisive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more redolent of femininity, delicateness. But on the other side, it's also labor intensive, very mm -hmm. labor intensive. And it also represents privilege, because who could afford to buy lace and wear it? Yeah. Did you choose the material for any of those reasons, or did that just come through naturally? Oh, yeah. For sure. When I first started in the older pieces, I think I was working with much more lace. Mm -hmm. And um, I did think that there was division in it, because it um, demarks the haves and the have-nots um, and, and the labor um, to have that kind of adornment. Um, you know, it, it would take, as you say, it's, it's more intensive work, it's more involved, yeah, yeah. and um, I think it has conceptual connotations with the elite in a way. So let's move over to the continents. Mm -hmm. And what struck me about them is why it's a triptych, okay? Were you in any way thinking of uh, Europe, Africa, and America? Or was there something else behind the triptych? That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking of. Okay. I was thinking of the continents of my own identity. Um, so America, um, Europe, and Africa. And I was also thinking about, I wanted to make a big work of art and um, it, it, this is so funny. I'm not a math girl. I'm very smart in a lot of ways, but um, I <laughs> I determined the size of that piece by measuring my car to see like what is the biggest what how big can I go that it will still fit into my car? And I did these measurements, and then um, I proceeded and I um, framed it out and did a, this triptych, and it took me three years to complete that. And then um, I got into a show in LA, I was very excited, and I went to go put it in my car, On the getting ready to load my car to go to LA for this show after three years of making it, and realized, wow, this does not fit in my car. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm an art historian, so I like things like diptychs and triptychs and mm -hmm. sort of, that religious connotation, 
Um, I, it was definitely informed for my own continents, but I wanted it to be ambiguous. I wanted people mm -hmm. to find their own story. And um, when I've shown it, I, I've really enjoyed what people have said, things that never occurred to me. Like um, people have said it reminds them of writing um, or that um, someone said it reminded them of skin or mm. even of uh, like musical um, notation. So um, I really do like the ambiguity, but I was definitely thinking about my three continents. I was thinking about geological deep time. And that's why my next question may sound off the wall, because you said the layers of geological time. But when I looked at it, I wondered whether you were um, alluding to continental shelves. Mm. You know, um, you know it, in any way, is this a textile metaphor for the fact that most commercial exploitation of, from the sea takes place on the continental shelf, and then you can extrapolate from that, are you referring to human exploitation? I'm referring to both. Okay. So I, when I was making it, I was thinking of landscape. I, I'm not going to lie, I was not thinking of continental shelf. Okay. I'm going to look that up <laughs> when I get home and see what I can yield from that. But. But I also started, I made all three at the same time, so I was sort of traveling from one to the other. Um, and I was, I started thinking of the materials like DNA folds. So also um, like, like the fabric were DNA traits from past, so traveling through continents, through bodies, right? Through my mm -hmm. ancestors mm -hmm. and to get at that entanglement of a longer history, but I was also thinking about the movement of resources and people across bodies of water through forced and voluntary migrations, as is true in my background. Well, I, I also thought about, you know, the layer, um, the layering about the count, the countless stories behind textiles. So, for example, where was the cotton grown? Who labored in the fields? who sold and transported the goods, who eventually wore them, and who was then tasked with laundering and ironing them. So they could be continental shelves in that way, you know, the layering of, of all the stories behind the fabric that you put on the canvas. It's on a canvas, isn't it? It's on crinoline. It's on crinoline, but on a board? Stre it's crinoline stretched on stretcher bars, and crinoline, okay. crinoline is the fabric that was used to make um, hoop skirts. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I still remember petticoats. Yeah, and petticoats, <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think I was. I think all of that was true, and I think the work is is um, open to multiple interpretations. I'm just going to go back to the threads that bind for a moment because the reason I did stitching on that was um, to allude to that idea that um, slavery was something that was the whole country benefited from, right? The, and, right. and some of the mm -hmm. stitches go outside of the frame um, because the North, you know, even though those states were free, they made a lot of money through banking and shipping um, the products, just as you were alluding to and thinking right. about all of the layers of meaning in the cotton. So I'm going to move on to the textile sculptures. And I have some questions about them because, um, you know, we think of textiles or cloth as something foldable, something stretchable something that we manipulate with our hands and that changes shape when it's on our bodies. And yet you applied resin, damask resin, and was it also wax or something? Beeswax. Beeswax. And Damar. And Damar then resin. A layer of resin. Damar resin. And so we have something that ordinarily would be filled with a body part, you know, whether it's an arm for a sleeve or someone's chest or torso. And 
instead there's an emptiness there. And I'm wondering what prompted you to turn them into a bust in this way? Why change the textile into something so solid? I love that question. Um, when I first started pushing this work towards sculpture, I did a lot of experimentation and I imagined I was going to make a, a cyclone, a floor to ceiling cyclone. And I was thinking about the Me Too movement. I was thinking Hillary Clinton was going to be our first female president. And I just felt this energy like women are coming into their, their power. Mm -hmm. And I started experimenting with all kinds of, of binders to see what I could do. Um, and actually, I mean, the first three or four months, I spent a summer doing it. And I was kind of in despair because it felt like a failure, you know, because what I was getting were these weird, fragile, ghostly forms. and um, The opposite of power. The opposite of power. <laughs> yeah, they were weak, they were ghost-like, they were fragile. <laughs> Uh, but I was still really compelled by them. And I was wor working with different um, substances and pretty small. And then, um, and, then I, and then, of course, things went how they went, and Trump uh, became our president. And so I felt like it, that it was appropriate, that really the direction I want, what I want, I embraced the fragility and the ghost-like pres uh, presence that they evoked, and then I scaled up. And so when I scaled up, and something I was noticing before is that when you put them in wax, the textiles in wax, they, um, they kind of register the memory of wear. And so, mm. um, and that was really interesting to me. So they became, they evoked the presence of these whoever wore them historically um, in ways that were really haunting. And for me, it felt like a warning. Like, that's become even more poignant in a way with all this Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. stuff, you know, because I felt like these, but these blouses were like, I was also creating a women in art history class, and so I was engaged in that um, history in ways, you know, like I didn't know there were black suffragettes before. Um, women died fighting for these rights that we have that I certainly took for granted and thought we were, you know, just moving forward. And so I felt like they were, um, you know, they were there, but they were like sending a message, you know, like we fought for these rights that you have, but they are fragile and they are um, like democracy. Yeah, like democracy. And so I sort of went with it and um, embraced them. And these, were, these pieces are so interesting because it really came out of experimentation. I hadn't seen anybody really doing this, so I didn't have models and, you know, just, so then it became like problem solving because the wax takes a long time to settle. So then I ended up painting resin on them and then actually um, you know, sometimes the resin spills over, so then I go in with a small rotor tool and saw off the edges and file things mm. down and then mm. kind of put mat over it. So it, they're interesting to me because there's a lot of work that goes into them, you know, aside from like dipping them into the encaustic, you know, kind of finding this light touch of giving them form but letting them rest into what memory is there and then solidifying mm -hmm. that. But a lot of my mark making is invisible, mm -hmm. actually. But I do think that they result in these um, compelling works. I yeah. know as I look at them, I was just thinking about uh, starch. Had you thought of really starching the hell out of them so that they would sit up? I like the collapse. OK. I like the um, I like the contrapposto stance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like the um, the wilting in them. Mm -hmm. um, I might do. I am considering doing some dickies that are brand new. You can still buy them, 
and I am thinking of doing them in very rigid, starched ways, uh -huh. um, and kind of scaling that idea up, um, sort of as a as my response to sort of the courts and what's happening with the courts, and and you know using and that for that I would want to use new materials. I want them to be rigid, um, but for these I wanted. Um, I just liked the fragility. Okay. Well, I noticed that you have names, Frances Ellen Watkins and Daisy Elizabeth Adams Lampkin, um, names I've never heard of before. And you use names, I think, also for the sleeves. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about your choice of these names, of these particular women. What can you tell us about them? Yeah, they were, uh, both of them were abolitionists. They were black suffragists. And um, I think it's the teacher in me that's like, it, it saw this as an opportunity to bring in um, or highlight mm. particular unsung heroes of the past. And the teacher in me is like, look her up, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, they were um, uh, Francis Ellen um, Harper Watkins was the first public published author. So um, yeah, there are people that most people don't know about, and um, I wanted to highlight them. And I'm going to do some more. I have more that I want to do. And also, I also was in, uh, interested in um, who do we think of when we see that kind of blouse? And I think that um, I wanted to challenge that a little bit. You know, I think mm -hmm. that we uh, sometimes forget that the black experience has a diversity and complexity to it, that they, we have periods of history where there was a thriving um, black middle class, for example, mm -hmm. even in the um, 19th century or the early 20th century. And so I wanted to name them after black women specifically. So I, I was here a week ago visiting the gallery because even though I had seen some work before, I just wanted to get a sense of the exhibit in a space mm -hmm. rather than stacked in a studio. And the first thing I noticed when I walked into this gallery was, at least for me, a very soothing and soft quality. And I think that the color choice, this kind of creamy, peachy color, uh, lent itself to that feeling. And the way the exhibit is hung, there's a feeling of openness in this room, a feeling of spaciousness, which I think is really important also for absorbing what you're getting across. But I also wondered how much of this had to do with any intention on your part related to your meditation practice? And moving on from that, how you see a relationship between the creative process and the meditation practice? I do, and thank you for saying that. I always wonder. Um, if that's coming across. I think, I mean, sometimes I'm really struggling with the work and really grappling with it. And, um, but I think meditation can also be like that. You know, you sit <laughs> and your own stuff comes up to be grappled with, to be, you know, um, dealt with. And I do mm. think there's a similarity in, um, the attention and focus that artists have when they're sort of in the flow of it, of making work, and um, and I think that that is very similar to meditation, actually. So you know, a lot of these pieces, um, when I get in that flow, I work while I'm in that flow, and then you know, allow whatever's next to occur to me, and then. Um, you know, when it's not there, then I'll come back to it. So I do think that 
um, there is a similarity in having focused attention and presence in making art where sort of everything else kind of falls away in that focus mm -hmm. and meditation. Yeah. Well, I was also thinking about um, how in reaching back into history through your mm -hmm. pieces and the materials you use, so there's this quiet feeling here, but everything's really referring to tumultuous times and events. And so there's a balance of being in this lovely space and your work not being in your face, um, jagged or really um, ugly. In, you know how some, I find some artwork today quite, I have to use the word, in my mind anyway, ugly. Um, and not, not. I'm I'm unable to reach into it because it's so off-putting. It's so loud. And there's something about the quality here, the softness and a serene feeling in the room. I think that makes it more amenable to taking in what you have to say. Now I don't know how you feel about the other kind of artwork, but. I find it really difficult to receive from that kind of artwork, whereas this is not in your face. I think um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question for me to respond to. I mean, I think I'm a fan of provocative work, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of the ugly, actually, mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are like some of the pieces that are in this work are, you know, when I'm collecting materials, I'm actually looking for the ugliest, that you know, the stained, the mm. sweat, sweat mark kind of stuff, um, rather as opposed to the well-preserved and clean and materials. But I will concede that um, there is a part of me, um, especially I think when I was making Continence and Blink, that um, wanted a return to beauty. Um, and I think beauty is something that there are probably, you know, like love, there are many, many different definitions mm -hmm. for what is beautiful and what is love. Um, but I am somebody who, I do need my own engagement with beauty. It sustains me. Um, it helps me process things. It makes it sort of worth persevering. I think um, someone having survived a lot of trauma, you know, like my house, you've been to, many of you have been to my house. Um, it's kind of a, it offers a sanctuary or mm -hmm. a safe place and so um, I do think, I do want the opportunity for us to have conversations about the entanglements of our history and um, the harm it's done in our shared humanity. And I do, I do want us to have that conversation. And so I think um, I do strive to lure people in a little bit in my work. I confess, you heard it here first. <laughs> it's true, I do. You know, and I think I was sort of, um, you know, I mean, there's different kinds of beauty, right? There are some mm -hmm. artists who make really beautiful work that is a demonstration of like a particular technical skill or a, a, an expression of light or the handling of, pigments and light and shadow in ways that are give us some relief. And I think that this work is not necessarily doing that, but I think it's the ambiguity. It's the ambiguity in a lot of it that allows us to uh, find our own stories in it, whether those stories are in agreement or alignment or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's um, something I'm really interested in. 
I don't see stained or torn fabric as ugly. Mm. Um, I, I, and we could go on about that, but there, there's just a kind of aggressiveness in certain work. And so maybe ugly is not the right word, but it doesn't draw me in, whereas mm -hmm. hearing your intention, I think there is something about not, not provoking in a particular way that allows people to hear, to see, yeah. to engage. I mean, I think that, that there's some truth to that. I mean, I think as an art, an instructor of art history, for example, you know, I don't, I'm not there to form opinions or tastes, artistic mm -hmm. tastes, and, and I'm not even there to promote my personal um, tastes in art history, although maybe that comes through a little bit. But it's about understanding. It's mm -hmm. about um, understanding what a work of art means and how do we understand that work of art. And so um, I think I'm trying to do that with my work. But I think that there is some, you know, I think in some ways to make a flag that's split down the middle along slave lines is can be perceived as aggressive to certain perspectives. And I think mm -hmm. the Dickey series um, has its, uh, I think it's just my style is just a little bit more um, subtle, but you know, mm -hmm. the Dickey series and to title those, you know, Patriot, Savior, and Great Again, there is a pointedness to that work um, that has relevancy and some might see that as aggressive, um, making them like false shields with gaping empty mouths. and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I and so I do think that there are layers to the work that are uh, can be perceived as aggressive, especially since I'm entering them into the discourse and asking people to consider that even little girls Alabama, it's like it's vulnerable, but it is evoking a, a very right. aggressive um, moment in history and asking people to think about that again. Well, remember the expression that someone tells me a lot, one person in my life, and that is, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Mm -hmm. So if you're using honey, I think you'll ca you, you're capturing much more attention and interest. But debatable. Yeah, okay. we'll see. Thank um, you, though. So behind us is the identity mapping series, and I was seeing in them a kind of conjoining of continents as you mm -hmm. reach back into your global DNA history, your background in the United States, and I, I see again and again those three continents in your DNA in the maps with the photographs. And am I wrong in thinking that there is a desire for integration, for bringing it all together, and embracing it? I mean, how did you wind up creating this series? I love that. Um, mm. Well, the, <laughs> the impetus was really the opposite. I mean, the, mm. the, first, the first one I made was California, um, where I, I, and it came out of a desire to leave the United States. I thought, um, I thought it would be great if we could just cut California away yeah. and let some water get in there take our economy with us and our values and um, yeah just be our own country we're the sixth largest economy in the world and I was just like you know again these stranger danger states that I was feeling really alienated from I was like do we need you know let them go go <laughs> give them back to Mexico give Texas back to Mexico right um, and so it came out of a desire to leave the initial one. But then I was just thinking about how entrenched people are in where they came from and, and where they live, how they identify with. Um, I mean, people do that every, people even do that just in, in, the, in the Bay Area. You know, there's these, or in California, there's this, um, 
you know, superiority complex of Northern California against Southern California. You know, there's um, East Bay is cooler than Peninsula. Kind, of, they're just people are really entrenched mm -hmm. and have strong feelings about places that that they feel are, have to do with their identity, and so. Um, and, you know, just all of the stuff around migration, just this idea that um, people can't move, you know, that, or, you know, accusing people of being illegal aliens, right? When, when border, borders change, right? And it's often tied to political and economic realities. And so I, um, I started making my own continents, really. Of my, okay. these are my continents. Okay. I'm my own world, and what does it look like? And it's all these different maps. And I was, um, I was also wanting to um, undo some of the fixation around place mm -hmm. or fixed ideas that we have in this. Because I was using a satellite, current and historical maps, some maps that those countries no longer exist. Like I have, yeah. uh, some of the maps might have Cherokee Nation territory or Choctaw territory. I played with scale, making the United States small and Sweden big. Or, um, And then I also printed them on rice paper so that when I um, collaged them with wax, they became see-through. So you might in these collages, you might be in Africa, and then you're in Sweden, and then you're in California. So just mm -hmm. mixing it all sort of together, and um, and how does that show up in, in people? You know, all these places that we identify with. And they could be like our origins, but it could be a place that had a significant impact on mm -hmm. someone that becomes part of their identity. I mean, I think I, heard you tell Fabian that you had lived in Colombia for right. a while and you have really good Spanish. And, you know, is that part of your identity now? It, would that be one of your maps in the collage? So It, it would be, you're right. Yeah, so these yeah. are the kinds of things, sort of, in a way, it was an undoing of maps. And I think mm -hmm. we tend to think of maps as like some form of empirical evidence, you know, um, and, uh, I think they're much more fluid, and so I was trying to get at that oh. in this series. Very different than what I saw, <laughs> <laughs> which is perfect. Uh, so I uh, like your version, though. It's well, so uh, kind. You know what I mean? <laughs> like embracing it, and, and um, yeah, I think that's that's my that's what's up my sleeve, luring luring people in and the beauty. But <laughs> I, I don't know that I would have come to that except that. The photographs you include yeah. are family members. Yeah. And so I just got this sense of you're bringing everyone together in some way, no matter where they came from or uh, what they identified with. Yeah, I think I am. I think you're absolutely right. I think this, this series, once I did the first few, I struggled with the first two, and then I just had, they just came out. There's 11 total, and um, I was using family members. And I think these works, it's part of a series, but I think each one also has its own meaning. So um, I'll just talk about a couple of them. Like my father, the one in the middle in the top row, Drive Me to the Moon. Um, that's my father, and um, he is, it's a photograph from the 60s. And I love how he's, um, he has so, a look of pride on his face, you know, like, this is my car. And um, it's not that great of a car, really, you know what I mean? And, and so for me, part of it is sort of the truncated goals of people of color of, like, what is possible mm -hmm. in terms of success and achievement. Um, and it's part of why, you know, he's not flying to the moon. He's hoping to drive to the moon, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think, like, there's a lot of ideas just in that one work. Um, and bringing all and Africa and, you know, all that history with him in the trunk of his car, all that junk. 
of mm -hmm. where he's from and those that heritage and that experience as he gets ready to drive. Um, I think the one of my mother, which is on the bottom and the far right, I really struggled with that piece um, because my mother was a challenging person um, for me personally. But I felt that she was part of the diaspora, I think, that I was spe wanting to speak to in this work. And, um, and her background is very homogenous. She's just Swedish as far as the eye can see. Um, but I ended up um, doing this sort of double image of her, and then I cut the maps that inform my heritage that I was working with um, and saw her as sort of a vessel of the diaspora. Right, so all of those little flowers um, floating around mm -hmm. the composition. And I, I loosely did this sort of DNA pattern with those, our um, Africa, Sweden, California, America, you know, that those, the diaspora came through her. Um, Doesn't it feel, to me, there, there's a, a feeling of innocence in that photograph. Mm -hmm. You know, before she became the complex, challenging person for you. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, my mother was really beautiful, and that's part of her complexity for me. And um, I think also the fact that she's deceased, you know, then I become the person who tells her story. Mm -hmm. And um, how do I find a way to kind of um, embrace her and include her? Uh, but also not um, erase my own experience with her. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's a tricky one. And I, you know, a lot of the work that I do is, is it's how I process. It's how I process the experience of, of being alive in this moment that I am alive in, yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to point out about your work that I haven't asked about? Uh, well, I mean, I could go on. Um, I think the only one we haven't talked about directly is jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and um, those are the sleeve installations. And I made that at um, when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, our RBG, was clinging to life. And that's when I first started thinking about the implications of what would happen what if she, when she died. and. Um, and so there are nine sleeves that represent the Supreme Court justices, and three of them, at the time that I made this, have a little bit more of a feminine sleeve cuff, although we don't necessarily know. I don't know if those sleeves are male or female, but I was also kind of starting to veer into a little bit of um, gender ambiguity in textiles and in clothing, um, but juxtaposed against these two um, very lacy and definitely gendered um, sleeves. So um, I was thinking about the balance of power. And, um, and it's, it's taken on a new patina of meaning and importance. And I think. Um, definitely now. Yeah, and so I, that's a piece that I want to do a different version of and scale it up because um, it's become so poignant. Well, in that regard, um, do you see yourself continuing in this vein, or is there another issue that you want to address through your artwork? Um, I am somebody who has a long list of things that I'd like to address in this world mm -hmm. <laughs> and in my artwork. For sure. And I have a number of pieces that are like 75, 80% done. And then I have other works that are uh, presenting as more um, urgent. So um, I, I like working with textiles for a variety of reasons. And I like engaging with them in new ways where I feel a little bit lost. Um, or not, not in control. Some of the language is more developed than others. And so I think I may, re I see myself returning to textile paintings and I see myself also 
uh, I'm interested in pushing it towards installation in, in those bodies of works. I even have a whole series that I want to do in the mapping series. So um, I have a lot of, a lot of ideas. Great. Thank you yeah. so much, Cynthia. Thank you. Really appreciate all your answers. Thank you. I appreciate all your questions. They're great. Do you have any questions from the audience? I guess I had a question about the Easter works. And yes. Out of curiosity, um, what was leading your creative process um, you know, for putting the pattern together? And it, it doesn't have to be you know, a deep answer, but what, I guess my question is about like the process of like, I'm going to put this pattern here and then the other. Mm -hmm. I guess what, what was your creative process for these two works? Well, they are, I mean, there are two, a diptych of two, two works. And um, I knew I wanted them to be square. And I knew I wanted them to be, um, I wanted to in there. And that part of the composing is very intuitive, actually. So I have, you know, a pile, I have boxes and bags and piles of um, fragments. And I, I knew I wanted to do it in a grid. You know, I was really um, loving the work of Agnes Martin and her, um, and the way that she was able to kind of use these really simple grids to evoke a feeling that was but stripped of sort of dogma, you know, and, and um, you know, so I was interested in that. I knew I wanted to do the grid, um, and it was just intuitive. Um, I, I don't really undo anything um, or, you know, I mean, these were, this is the earliest work in this room, and so uh, Catherine Sherwood, who was, who you know, who is my mentor at UC Berkeley, she really challenged me in terms of um, why square? Why on crinoline? Why not an opaque background? What if it was more landscape? What if it was more portrait? And I think a lot of this, this whole, really all of these experiments grew out of her challenging me um, in that way. Yeah. I have a question about you mentioned sourcing patterns from the antique mm -hmm. I'm always on the hunt. So if I'm somewhere, um, if I'm somewhere that that opportunity presents itself, I will look. Yeah, I'll look if there's a. I mean, I part of it is I'm. I don't want to spend a whole bunch of money, so I don't like. I don't go on eBay looking for specific things. But what's great about Alameda is there are 700 vendors, and a lot of them are coming from the East Coast. Um, not so much post COVID, not so much now, um, but before. Like I, I was, I had the experience. There's one guy that comes from Boston, and um, he just throws these piles of stuff on these tables, and I literally found a like petrified rat. Yeah, in the tangle of things I was looking through. So I love that you see you see them as beautiful. And they are. I agree with you. But I think, yeah, when I'm there looking, like I'm not necessarily looking at the, look at this pristine Victorian dress. I'm like looking under the tables for the boxes of stuff that they think is rejects and wanting to look at that. So I, did, I do the same thing when I go to Asia. Um, I, I go to these temple markets, for example, in Japan, and I get these old kimonos and obis, and I take them apart, and the lining is stained from the person's perspiration, by, uh, skin, you know, oil, and so on. And then I've dyed the lining with rust, and the colors change so dramatically and so beautifully. So. It, I never think of that as ugly. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. 
Yeah, and so there's a lot of there are a lot of people there. That's quite why I go there a lot because rather than me driving all over the place, um, there's vendors that are coming from all over the place to count to that specific event. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, first of all, this was a great sprint thing. Up. Awesome that was part of this and just having my chance. And I'm looking at the uh, thread that I'm in my It's not originally from Maryland, born and raised, so I was looking at you know, my state. I was like, I appreciate it's been divided in Chesapeake Bay. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my question is since, uh, in regard to like continents and you know, link and even um, the threads that bind the, the divided nation. Um, I know this is personal. I noticed that a lot of the, the color way was a you know creamish, um, you know on a very earth tone sometimes, and nudish as well. And, and I guess like the thought process on using that color way. Have, have you ever thought about like using, or not even thought about, but the um, reasons why you chose that particular like color way rather than using you know, other colors? I am so glad you yeah. asked that question. Um, Let me, I'll start at the beginning. So, um, or I'll just start from the statement saying that I do like to flip the script. And so when I was studying art history, I remember having a really distinctive, uncomfortable moment in a graduate seminar where one of the students was arguing about a work by um, Purview that he had painted this um, abstract sculpture black, and therefore it must be about race. And there is mm. this, that happens a lot in the art world where um, if an artist uses black, it um, sort of stands in as if it is about race. It must be about race, right? And it really made me uncomfortable. And, and there were a lot of students of color in the room that day, and nobody kind of spoke up. And so this one, sorry, white student got to go on about making her argument that, well, he chose to paint it black, so it must be about race. And it stayed with me for a long time, and it made me uncomfortable because I thought that it really limited the ways we could talk about that artist's work. Mm -hmm. to pigeonhole it in that way, to reduce the complexity and all the things that we could say. And no one ever says that about white artists making work out of white materials. No one says, why did Ryman make these white works? What was he saying about whiteness or the white race? No one ever asks that. That is not a conversation that ever happens. And so I wanted to work, I wanted to sort of defy that and challenge that. What does it mean for a black artist to work with white materials, making statements about black experience? How do you like me now, you know? Um, and no one ever asks me that question, you know, and I also, that, so that is one of the layers of the work. I also um, thought about, you know, um, I mean, one of the things that I want to say in my work is that oppression and racism, obviously it hurts black people, but it hurts white people. I often find myself asking for people who really engage in that kind of racism historically, like, what happened to your humanity? that you did that, that you sold your own child. You know what I mean? That was half black or one drop of black. Like how could you, how could you do that to your own humanity? So um, that is part of that defiance. I mean, I think the fact that I teach our history and that I'm a black woman teaching a discipline that is predominantly um, scholar, you know, Caucasian scholars is another way of flipping the script and bringing a different perspective into it. Um, so that's part of what, what I'm interested in. Now, having said that, um, recently I saw um, uh, Hennessy's work at SOMART, Angela Hennessy, 
and she, I was in awe of the way she works with black materials. And I have started to collect some black textiles because I'm curious about um, uh, what that would mean to have a body of work in black at this point. You know, um, so that is something that I'm considering. I'm not really an all over the rainbow type of girl. I know some people do that with textiles really successfully. I've done some experiments with using a, a wider range of colors and it's, it's not really my thing. I mean, maybe that will change in the future, but um, yeah, I like a reined in, I like a tight palette. Yeah, but thank you for that question and sorry if I scared you by banging on no, the No, <laughs> you know, um, I, I didn't ask you that question because it didn't occur to me why you couldn't use white fabric or why, I mean, if you're interested in lace, generally old lace mm -hmm. is different shades of white, ecru, beige, and so on. And these kinds of blouses, if you were part of that era, it didn't matter what skin color you had, yeah. that was what you wore. So it wouldn't even occur to me to question yeah, I'm playing why you would with use that. that. I'm definitely yeah. playing with that intentionally. That's part of you know, naming these busts um, after um, black activists and abolitionists. You know, it's like, who do we think of when we see um, clothing like that? Do we, you know what I mean? Do we think of white people as sort of owning that era of history? And then to kind of flip that a little bit just to um, create more possibility and complexity in the way we talk about history and black experience. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.